Well, <clears throat> um, to start off, um, we are going to set some round rules. Um, if you can, if you have questions for Robert King, we're going to have a Q&A after he's done speaking. And then at that point, we can take questions. And we just ask for people to keep them short questions, like 20 seconds. You know, it's not really a platform to go on and on. Um, but uh, yeah, ask questions, keep it short so more people can ask questions. And, um, yeah. And then another um, thing we ask is for no flash photography. Um, yeah, no flash photography. And we ask, we request people not to do audio or video recording. Okay. Um, now I'm going to announce some things, um, some more events coming up for Rethinking Prisons Month. <clears throat> Tomorrow, uh, I am Troy Davis, the human impact of the death penalty. It's going to be happening at 3 o'clock. Um, and then um, also tomorrow at 6 o'clock, Boots Riley is going to be speaking about hip-hop, mass incarceration, and class struggle. And all this information is on this handout that you receive. And um, later this week on Thursday, Christian Williams is going to be speaking about policing and counterinsurgency in Lecture Hall 2. And then this Friday, um, this is going to be a radical self-defense course by Greg, Gregory Lewis from Seattle. And that's going to be from 11 to 1 o'clock. And that is for students only. Um, for up more upcoming events, check out this and check out our website um, and Facebook. Um, yeah. So now Katie's going to introduce Robert King. Right. Um, today we are really honored to have Robert King here. Um, he is from New Orleans, Louisiana, and in 1969 he was uh, arrested and put in prison in the Angola prison in Louisiana. And uh, two years afterward, along with his comrades Albert Woodfox and Herman Wallace, um, who together they make up the Angola Three. Um, they, were, uh, they were targeted for their activism as members of the Black Panther Party and were put in solitary confinement. Uh, Robert King spent 29 years in solitary and was released in February of 2001. Albert Woodfox uh, still remains in solitary confinement and Herman Wallace, after 40 years, was released from solitary confinement last year but died shortly after his release. Since his uh, release from prison in 2001, Robert King has traveled the world speaking against solitary confinement and around the injustices of the prison system. In 2012, he received his honorary doctorate degree of laws from Cambridge, the one in England, not in Massachusetts. So together, will you help me welcome Robert King? We have a member of the press here, up there, um, and he's video or audio recording this event. So just so you know, um, you don't have to speak to the press, and what you say may be recorded. So thank you. Um, and thank you for coming out. Appreciate it very much. Um, I'd like to point it out, my name is Robert King, Robert H. King, and uh, after 31 years, um, 29 in South Carolina, I was uh, released from Louisiana State Prison at uh, Angola, uh, called it Angola, Louisiana, now, but uh, it was known as the plantation, farm, it was a prison. Uh, it takes its name, by the way, from uh, uh, the country of Angola, Angola, Africa. Uh, it is noted that I think that the majority of the the slaves who uh, out that area were from the country known as uh, Angola. I and mean, when tells slavery ended, or when slavery ended, and I use that in quotation, uh, the name stuck. Uh, it became known, and it's known now as Angola, which is just one of the names, Angola State Prison. It is also known as the phone, the mound, you call it what you want, uh, call it, but nevertheless, it is known as a penitentiary. You know, uh, of course, we have a different name for it, slave camp. Uh, my story began, as pointed out some years ago, um, I point out in my book, I believe, that, you know, actually I was, I'm real old school. I, as you can tell, you can see, I go way back. I'm a 
post World War II baby, you know, even before World War II. But I, I like to point out that my odyssey began sometime in 1970. Uh, I was arrested and charged uh, with relative to a home robbery, along with another individual. Uh, despite the fact that uh, the identification of the so-called perpetrator did not remotely resemble me, uh, every prior prison record was enough reason to uh, suspect that I perhaps was a culprit. By the way, again, I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana, and uh, the way they did things, you would think that I was probably one of the only persons uh, from Louisiana, from New Orleans, Louisiana, that had been in prison. Uh, not so. Uh, just about everybody I knew in my neighborhood, not everybody from New Orleans or Louisiana, but everybody from my, from my neighborhood that I grew up with uh, eventually went to some prison. Uh, and the neighborhood in which I, I bound into, it was a segregated neighborhood. This was, uh, in the fifties, where I was raised then. However, nevertheless, I point out that my odyssey probably began for the most part in 1970, being arrested for a charge in which I had not committed. And they offered me a, <clears throat> they appointed me a lawyer. I did not have um, any money to pay up for a lawyer or anything like that. So it was customary for the court to appoint you a lawyer. If you was indigent, you did not have a lawyer. Lawyer. That's customary, routine, formality. Uh, this lawyer came up to me and uh, said that when you were charged with relative to home robbery, uh, the DA came up to me and made a proposition. Uh, the DA told me, say, if you would take 15 years, uh, they would give you 15 years instead of, at the time, the maximum for home robbery was. 30 years. I ever since that time, uh, it has quadrupled. It went from 30 years to 60 years, from 60 to 99. And if you have a prior record, then you could get 198 for a robbery, even though uh, no injury occurred or no threat of violence or took place. But having a previous record, and I had recently married, and uh, my wife was uh, pregnant with my young son at the time. Um, I had a job. Um, I felt that I was totally American, and I was an American citizen uh, under the Constitution. And uh, I tried to do, you know, the thing that was basic that you did. You were married to your family. You tried to you know, make ends meet, and if you tried to strive for, uh, for some other thing, you did. At one time, I had the, I had the uncanny belief to believe that I would be uh, the middleweight champ of the world. Uh, um, of course, I know this sort of reminds some of you of Ruben Hurricane Carter, but it's typical of uh, being a, uh, you know, in the neighborhood, you know, being a African or uh, African American. At this, this particular time, you know, sports was one of the things that you look forward to because this is what they inspired. Uh, uh, this is what they wanted you to aspire to, probably some sport. I was too small to play football. I wasn't big enough to play football, not professional football anyway. So boxing was a thing with me. Uh, I wanted to be, I thought I was going to be the, uh, the middleweight champion world. Um, and, uh, so I got over into boxing. I had learned to box a little bit. Uh, previously, while I was in prison, I learned to box. And, I started engaging in semi pro bouts in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I was uh, doing pretty good, but it wasn't enough money, and my wife was pregnant so, uh, with a child coming along, and I wanted to do better. And uh, I got a job, and so forth and so on. I wanted to open up a little restaurant. I had envisioned that I would open up a restaurant and do some things. Uh, um, I had people in my family, formerly people who had owned restaurants, and I had some idea of how a restaurant was ran. Um, that did not happen, but in any event, uh, after this 19, February 1970, 
uh, this robbery had taken place. And again, um, they having a record, they took my photograph along with uh, several other photographs and uh, they pointed out to the witness and who uh, vehemently said that no, he did not have anything to do with it. Uh, it was not him. The person who robbed me was a man about 42 to 45 years old, real dark skin, no tattoos, no marks, anything on him, on him like that. So nothing about identification, but it was not this individual. However, nevertheless, um, the police continued to bombard a variety of this witness, and this witness uh, uh, eventually uh, succumbed to the idea that it's possible that I could have been uh, the perpetrator. Um, they eventually got this, I went to trial, they offered me a 15 year sentence. Again, I elected to go to trial, and they got this individual to say that I was the perpetrator, uh, despite the fact that there were no uh, evidence linking to this crime. So I went to trial. I did not take the 15 years. I elected to go to trial because I felt that no jury would convict me. Uh, despite the fact, you know, I said all of this lack of evidence that point toward me and the world, the jury could convict me. I was still under the illusion that there was some fairness in the judicial system. Uh, and I imagine some people would tell you, it depends on who you listen to, some people would tell you there is fairness. Um, but it wasn't any fairness for me in the, in the uh, uh, judicial system. I ended up going to trial, and this individual who had formerly stated uh, that uh, the perpetrator did not remotely resemble me, I made an in-court identification uh, at the origin of the district attorney, and, and this individual uh, directed a, a thing at me with the jury. And, uh, the jury found me guilty, and uh, I was given 35 years. Uh, it was at this time I began to look at the system in a different light. Uh, I had heard a lot about the system. I didn't know much about chattel slavery. Uh, I didn't know too much at that time about the Constitution. Uh, uh, I could not articulate the discrepancies and the racism of the thing that I learned with racism and discrimination that took place in my neighborhood and, and, and among my folks. I didn't have this, I didn't have the vision, uh, I, I didn't have the articulation to even articulate these uh, uh, type of thing. I had accepted them as being, you know, state of affairs. But it was this particular incident that I, I, I don't think I could allow myself to fathom. I was beginning to think, and while I understood discrimination and racism, and I understood segregation, I, I could not articulate these things. And, but nevertheless, I felt them. And I, it was at this time that I began to, to, to act out. I consider myself, in hindsight, I consider myself at that time when I left it now, I was a rebel uh, with the call, but I did not have a, a political consciousness. Uh, and it was at this time I began to to gain a political awareness and a political consciousness as to what was going on. I noticed one thing that I could not accept, uh, the fact that I was brought to trial, uh, charged, picked up, snatched away from my family, uh, given a charge, at first it was a relative to home robbery, and then upgraded to home robbery, actual home robbery, and then being offered a certain amount of time to plead guilty because I had had a previous record. But you know, um, it happened like that. Uh, during that period, the police, especially in New Orleans, Louisiana, where I was born, the police would arrest an in individual and they would place them under arrest. Uh, it did not make any difference whether or not this individual had committed uh, any crime or not. The fact is that they were arrested and a lot of time the police would coerce and beat up individuals and force them into pleading guilty to crimes in which um, they had not committed. And the ones who did not plead guilty to these crimes, um, they were held in prison for at least up to two years. Uh, the Constitution states that they could hold you, uh, I imagine that is the U.S. Constitution, not state Constitution, but the U.S. Constitution states that you could 
be here for up to uh, two years, you know, uh, without the due process being violated. Uh, and then after that, you should go to trial. So a lot of guys used to get arrested, and even though they, you know, uh, they know that they did not commit the crime, they would hold out for two years because knowing if they were not convicted in two years, the state would probably drop the charge or have them plead guilty to a, a lesser charge and give them two years and send them away. They would clean the book. They call this cleaning the book. Uh, they did not have a suspect, and they needed somebody to put the crime on. So if they got somebody, put them in jail, course them into staying in jail two years, or accepting a plea, or less a plea of a simple robbery charge, then that would clean the book. Then they had no problem with uh, this book. Uh, so, you know, they could clean the book, and this robbery uh, uh, would be solved. Well, that's what they uh, did with me, and I decided that uh, I would not accept this. I went to trial, and after they found me guilty, they gave me a 15-year sentence. And it was at this time that I really began to look at the system, despite the fact that I was not politically uh, conscious, uh, conscious at the time, I decided to look at the system in a much different light. I, I did not know a lot about slavery. That is chattel slavery, chain slavery. I didn't know a lot about it, but I had heard enough about it. And I decided at this particular time that I was being treated like a slave without being able to articulate this. Uh, I found myself being treated as a, as a slave. <laughs> Uh, I understood. I knew this, that a slave had no right that the slave master was, was bound to respect. And I also knew this, that if you were a slave, you was a slave legally, if not morally. I understood this, that there was immorality involved in slavery without being able to articulate this. So what I did, I decided to exercise the rights of a slave. <laughs> The only right that a slave had, because a slave who lived in chapter of slavery did not have a right to do anything, did not have a right, did not have a legal right to do anything. But I also knew this, that a slave had a moral right. It was a moral right, it was a gift that does not come from legality. I began to equate the two, look at the two, legality and morality. And despite the fact that some people except that if something is legal, it is deified by God and made holy. And I begin to see that we live in a legal system that plays more emphasis on legality than it did on morality. I begin to say, when I understood later on about chattel or slavery, I began to see this, that it was legal to own slaves. But it wasn't until the people of that day began to see chattel slavery as being something morally reprehensible, that slavery was, quote, abolished as we know it. I began to see that just because something was legal, regardless of who implemented it, legality does not take precedence over morality, and I made this equation with doing chattel again, that it wasn't until people, all people, saw slavery as being something that was morally reprehensible, that slavery as we know was abolished. So what I did was, I decided to, after getting 15 years, getting 15 years for crimes which I had not committed, I exercised the right of a slave, and the only right that a slave had uh, doing chattel was to rebel. My way of rebelling was to escape Slavery. And that is definitely what I sought to do. What I decided to do was when they gave me, I went to trial, found guilty, they gave me a 35 year sentence, and I decided to exercise the right of a slave. And that is to rebel, that is to escape. And I did, it was short lived. Uh, made claims I was being held in New Orleans Path Prison. And, uh, after being found guilty, I decided that I would do something about it. And without quitting anybody, all I wanted to do was get out of prison, escape slavery. And so we made a plan. It was myself and some few other people who wanted to escape also. And we escaped. Uh, we were successful. I think 12, 26 people that wanted to leave that night, but only about three left. And yours truly was among uh, those few. I did get out, I made it out, and two other people made it out. Of course, another brother made it out, and, and he was killed.
some six hours later. And I, I must tell you, I was reapprehended and I was uh, given uh, another seven years for the aggravation in which, uh, eight years, brother, for the aggravation that I caused them. They told me it aggravated the state. And I got that, I have to admit this. Every chance I got with this newfound knowledge that I had, every chance that I got to aggravate the system, I did it. I tried my best to aggravate them each time. They put me in a place. I tried my best to escape. The only reason why I did not was because I couldn't. And I make no apologies for that for nobody. And I just stood on many stages and many stands across many countries. And I have said the same thing. I make no apologies for that. And if I was put in that position again, I would do the same thing again. Because again, the only right that a slave have is, is one to rebel. And when you rebel, you rebel by any means necessary. And even though I did not go into all the any means necessary uh, context of it, but I did escape, which was good enough for me. And I tried to escape every chance I got. I tried to aggravate them every chance I got. But that wasn't to be. I ended up, you know, being reapprehended. And I was brought back to the New Orleans Pass prison. And it was at this particular time that I remember I was being held on the fifth floor in solitary confinement, as a matter of fact. Um, and the fifth floor in the New Orleans Pass prison was a place where um, they used to hang before the electric chair came on the set. And the fifth floor was a place where they put people at. And they still had the noose. Uh, they still had the pole in the floor where they used to drop the body whenever they hang somebody. And I was being held there with about four other people, uh, some other <coughs> individuals who they had probably uh, said that we were security risks. Uh, some, some of the people I knew, some I, I, I did not know. But it was at this particular time I began to, there was a small television that was there. Uh, we were in individual cells, 24 hours a day. Um, and we were in individual cells. But there was a small television that was sitting out in the hallway. And it wasn't there for us because there were mesh wire uh, on, on the balls where we were. I mean, we, it was a case in mesh wire. Uh, but there was a TV out in the hallway, and the officer who guarded the tier, he watched uh, the television. But we could hear it. And it was from the, this television, uh, I heard this broadcast, uh, it was a, uh, announced, he broke into one of the regular programming and say we have a special bulletin and I, I, it was learned that there was a group of quote militants down in the night wall shooting it out with the police. Uh, the night wall is a place in New Orleans. It was one of the biggest project, black project, uh, African American project at that, that particular time. Uh, they had anywhere from 10, 15, 25 million people, I mean 25,000 people uh, living in that uh, particular housing. Duplex. And but, uh, I learned that the Black Panther Party had uh, migrated from the St. Thomas Thomas Housing Project. I also learned that they had been in New Orleans for, I had heard about the Black Panther Party, but I had never, you know, given any thought. I had heard of Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad, I had heard of a whole bunch of people, but it didn't ring a, a, a bell with me. I understood what they were, you know, uh, what they were about. And I, I oh, this was America. And you always had the dissenters and people were, who, you know, were, were doing things, but I had not heard about the Black Panther Party uh, had, having come to the, I heard about what they were doing, and I heard that they had camps. Uh, I didn't know that they were in the city, but I had heard about it. But I learned at this particular time that they had been in the city for, since 1969, and they had migrated from the St. Thomas Project down to the project in, in the night ward, and that they were being evicted by the, by, 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 by the, the government, by the state police. Of course, those of you who know anything about the Black Panther Party, know that Jerry Hoover by this time has stated that the Black Panther Party was the biggest internal threat in the, in the nation and that they have to be uh, displaced, they have to be uh, upselled, have to be eliminated. And he did his best to eliminate and subsequently uh, he did so. Uh, he isolated uh, the, the Black Panthers, the, the ideology of the Black Panther Party. Uh, he, uh, put a lot of information out there, he demonized the Black Panther Party, saying that they hated all white folks, and that they felt all white folks needed to be killed and so forth. So, so nothing could really could be further from the truth. But people about this at this time, and Diego Hoover was uh, able to uh, alienate uh, the Black Panther Party from the people, and not let that baby reach that just state of state. Uh, because the Black Panther Party had an ideology, you know, uh, that was akin to the United States uh, uh, Constitution. You know, when the United States say, we will, you know, when the Constitution, the 
preeminent to it, said we know it is true to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the creator with certain inalienable right to, you know, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just power from the consent of the government. All this kind of good rhetoric uh, talk. Well, the Black Panther Party also had an ideology. Uh, the, and the first, you know, they had a 10 point pla uh, 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 platform. And the, and the first one was, we want freedom, we want power to determine our destiny. An indication that blacks had never had, uh, in spite of all the stuff that had taken place in previous years, blacks did not have the power to determine their destiny. Uh, it went on to say, we want an immediate end to police brutality. Uh, uh, because, you know, the Oakland police, you had newly created uh, 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 the Black Panther Party in 1966, and it was done based on the fact that the Oakland police was killing especially young black people like, like they were mad. Uh, and so, uh, you and Newton, being a young law student, he decided to take his book and, and you know, stand a, 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 a sensible distance away from the police and read the rights uh, of, of the people, the people who was arrested or who was accosted by the police. And, 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 and you know, and, and the Black Panther Party was doing this. They were, uh, 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 you know, that was the idea of the Black Panther Party, let the, 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 let the people know that they were being harassed, they were being abused, that the rights in which the forefathers say that we should have, uh, we, were, we did not have these rights. And, and so as a result of this, the Black Panther, that was what the Black Panther Party was about. They say, we want land, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace as our major political objective. The United Nations supervised public site to be held inside, you know, throughout the black community with black colonial subjects. They saw us as being black people as being a colony within the United States. Uh, and that, you know, we were black, that, that we wanted, uh, you know, uh, that we needed, we, we needed an agenda, and we did not have this. So the Black Panther Party, despite the fact that they were demonized by the government and subsequently harassed out of ex ex existence, you know, it, 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 you know, it, you know, the fact that they were legitimate and they had a legitimate ideology, one that, 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 that was, you know, in conjunction with the American Constitution. But the point is this, J. Edgar Hoover could not uh, stand this. America was set on oppressing a certain segment of its people, especially black people. And so the, the Black Panther Party understood this. And this is what they talked about. They talked about the fact that black people, you know, were, were targeted by the, uh, the most arrest of, um, um, by the system. And this is why the, uh, the Black Panther Party was considered, they were demonized. Uh, the Black Panther Party had begun to feed, had the breakfast program. They had begun to feed, uh, and not because you may have seen the, the Black Panther, you yeah, saw song probably with the rape. Uh, this was a picture that was all over the country. You saw blacks marching down the street with guns uh, on their shoulders. Well, this was happening in 68 in California. California had a law, you know, which allowed you to carry weapons as long as it was not concealed, you know. The Ku Klux Klan carried weapons, in concealed weapons and unconcealed weapons. They carried weapons with masks over their face, the white citizen council, all of them had these weapons. They were never harassed by the police. However, nevertheless, when, when blacks exercised this right, they marched on the Capitol, they eventually uh, called it the Panther Law. They marched to the Capitol, California, which is Sacramento. Ronald Reagan was the governor uh, at the time. And he implemented, he came up, he induced his legislators to enact a Panther law to knock down that law.